this is Let's Talk, an on-the-air community forum which relies on our listeners to call in. Uh, we're getting to root causes of issues that affect us all, looking for solutions or just information or the collective wisdom of the community, and that is you. So, please, we welcome all thoughts without judgment. And our numbers are 415-663-8492 or 8317. Uh, when you call in, and I know you will, when you call in, hang on until you hear me say you're on the air, and then turn your radio down, give us a name, and please keep the language clean. Imagine you're talking to your grandmother or your <laughs> four-year-old child or something if that's, oh, although, I don't know. Does that still apply? I don't know. <laughs> Our hosts today are Shelley Ruck. Hello, good afternoon. Stephen Hurwitz. And I'm ready to give unsolicited advice, advice if Excellent. anybody needs it. Excellent. Well, there you are. Unsolicited <laughs> advice, straight from Stephen's mouth. And uh, I'm Paul Raffel. And today, we are, we are going to have a little uh, talk uh, on which we uh, we desire all opinions from our listeners and uh, uh, solutions, suggestions for solutions for the insect apocalypse. Lips, oh, no. lips, lips, oh, lips, no. lips, lips, lips. Yeah, sigh. I know it's a it's a heavy title, and I'm I have to say I'm kind of a kind of depressed about this whole thing. It's just one more thing. I know. Well, one you know, let's let's get thing. clear on what this means because uh, when I mentioned insect uh, apocalypse to someone, their first thought was the insects were going to eat us They're alive. Coming. <laughs> They're coming to get us. <laughs> a plague of locusts. Yeah, well, guess what? There aren't the enough locusts anymore. <laughs> so um, let's uh, let me. Uh, well, so. There have been some studies made in recent, in the past two or three years. Those um, scientists again. Scientists, I know. Entomologists, which are themselves, according to entomologists, a dying breed because nobody wants to fund uh, insect studies. Hmm, I wonder why. Yeah. Um, anyway, there have been a couple of really scary um, studies made. One was in Germany where they... Uh, where they could compare results from 40 years ago. And uh, and I have all the figures here. I just know. Anyway, terrible declines in all insect populations in that area, like 75% decline in population. Uh, same in there are studies in uh, Puerto Rico. Kenya, I think. Too. Kenya and uh, and all showing the same thing. Around the world, insects are dying off at an at a enormous rate. I mean, it's really precipitous. And, you know, we think of insects, bugs, and we slap them, we swat them. They're just a nuisance. They sting us. They get in our food. They get in our soda they cans. They eat my nasturtiums. They eat your nasturtiums. <clears throat> but insects uh, really are the Vital. driving force of the world, of the planet. Uh, uh, they'll still be here long after we're gone, of course, but there will be fewer of them. And mainly, and of course, the uh, the expert opinion is that it's all human-driven depredations that are driving them out of existence. And I think the vast majority of them, uh, we don't even know who they are. There's so many different insect varieties that... Uh Oh, they haven't even identified most of them. Yeah, that's well, right. Well, and then there's the other layer of this is uh, die-off of uh, animals that eat the insects. Yes. And there's less food for Birds, them. Birds, yeah. Birds and, uh, you know, mammals, or shrews, all those guys. Um, we, uh, I, in fact, just this morning I was reminded of uh, years ago, I think it was in the was it the 90s, maybe earlier, the 80s? House sparrows in Britain, in the UK, were disappearing. They were huh. put on an extinction list. Were put on a, wow. on a dangerous, you know, whatever it's called. Uh, they were going, they were an endangered species. That's there you it. Go. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> Good job. House sparrows. 
Wow, yeah. So and common. they uh, apparently, according to uh, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, uh, they started feeding select uh, communities of sparrows in urban settings with uh, mealworms and the uh, the the colonies came back. The, wow! Uh, so it was all about they were starving yeah. for insect food. Yeah. And uh, and okay, so part of the thing, and that led to more pages. Of <laughs> and it ends up. You're so good also, at doing all this research. It's Paul. also about uh, um, farming practices, and part uh, of that is yeah. what's causing the insect die off. Ur- right, urban growth. Urban growth, Farming. loss of habitat from urban growth, from do, farming. doing what we do, and uh, farming, yeah, farming methods that are uh, destroying the rhythms of the earth. So right. I also remembered skylarks, so I looked that up. Skylarks are disappearing from Europe, which, mm. you know, the sound of summer in, in Britain is this beautiful song as the skylark goes straight up in the air just twiddling and twiddling away they're becoming very rare and wow. that's partly because that's mostly because of farming practices they've changed the sowing season from spring to autumn because autumn crops are thicker or you know something uh the mowing practices uh mechanized mowing so they're when there's a nest in the field of wheat then the mower comes along and you know, so yeah so um well and I, I don't know i would imagine that all the use of roundup you know and roundup ready uh, ready agri- agriculture and of course. you know we don't think about that 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 product seeps into the soil and stays there it yeah, doesn't well, just disappear. Yeah, right. Well, that's how they marketed it for so many years. Oh, no, it just it dissipates. Mm. Uh, it does not dissipate. Well, that's one of the things about our organic food. It's just not about the spraying. It's about the fact that the environment is alive. The soil is a living thing. Mm. It creates a, a, you know, life, whereas yeah. uh, the, when you... When uh, traditional, uh, I mean, current agricultural, they, uh, the soil is really a medium for holding up the yeah, plant. It just keeps the plant oh, upright. Boy. Everything else is. is provided. Yeah. In fact, the idea is really to kill off, kill it off, and then fertilize it with artificial fertilizers because you know they cost money, and somebody's making a bunch of money oh, off boy. that. Instead of allowing the soil to regenerate, yeah. and yeah. Yeah, and in our culture, we're so divorced from how our food is made. And, you know, we're used to going into the supermarket and Mm -hmm. buying things off the shelves and assuming that it's safe. And, um, Mm -hmm. yeah. But I I like what you said about the the earth being alive, the soil being alive. The the insects are a big part of that, keeping that soil healthy and aerated and... Insects, including little mites that we don't even know about, you know, that we've never seen. Here's a, a bit of healthy soil, a foot square and two inches deep. That's not very much. Might easily be home to 200 unique species wow. of mites, each presumably with a subtly different job to do. Wow. And yet entomologists estimate that all this amazing, absurd, and understudied variety represents perhaps only 20% of the actual diversity of insects on our planet. There's just been not enough studies about how many species there are, for one thing. Nobody really knows. We know there's a million species that have been identified, but there's Does that mean that more. 80% have not been identified? Is that what that means? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oh, hey, do we have a what? caller? We Ah, hello, caller. You're on the air. What's your name, please? Sally. Yeah. Hi there, Sally. Good morning. Oh, afternoon. I know. Hello. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Getting used to that. That's so confusing. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm one of these sort of bleeding, bleeding heart type people. Where, like, just this morning, I was very worried about a bumblebee that was sort of um, not sufficiently responsive and he was just sort of m- melancholy or <laughs> something. He was having some issue and I I having a bad him, day. He was walking within dangerous proximity to, to my cat. Mm. <laughs> so I kind of picked him up on a leaf and put him in a planter uh, just to keep him like 
safe, you know, and then to see what would happen. Anyway, I went back and checked, and the little guy had flown away, which made me very relieved. But um, I'm just one of those people. But there are, there's been this long tradition of, like, skewering, well, this is very Victorian, but skewering uh, butterflies and all that mm, stuff. Right, collecting. You know? To collect and yeah. I, I just don't believe in any any of that, and and I never have. And I think that w- the big problem is, in my view, that is that we humans are so arrogant about nature. Oh right, <laughs> we're in charge. Yeah, we think that actually we know more, and that we have the final word because. We just know more, and everything else is a savage, no matter what it is. Right. right. And that combined sort of arrogance combined with greed and the Industrial Revolution has really caused this problem. I mean, no big news here. There's no revelation. but, But I'm just saying this is how I've always thought about it. And whenever I see bugs or... Even I even don't like to kill flies. Um, Oof, fly. I do. I know they're really annoying. But I mean, whenever I see little bugs that are struggling, I, I, I you know, I try to help them. Yes, <laughs> that's you do. sweet. Same here. We uh, spiders in particular. We always take the spider uh, out on the deck and yeah. release, catch and release with catch the spider. You know, uh, so, me too. And I, even the scorpions. I'm pretty scared of spiders, and yet I still, you I know. still do it. Um, but my, I guess what I wonder is with this is, is there a way to bring them back to rejuvenate pop, insect populations? Well, I, did, were you just talking about that? No, bring no. Back the birds or something. Well, he did mention that they were feeding mealworms to the house sparrows in in Britain, and okay, and Which, it was helping. So they found out how the sparrow was disappearing is that they were starving. We're going to uh, starve if the insects disappear. Well, yeah, everything. That's really? Thing. Yeah, I mean, we're done. That, the stakes are so high, and I just wonder, is there a way to bring back the bugs, you know? Well, um, what, they're, what the experts, entomologists, are saying is, you know, we know why it's happening. Habitat loss, uh, pesticide use, um, uh, urbanization, overpopulation of humans, doing all the terrible things we do to the world, uh, and um, and actually lack of lack of uh, information about insects because there's no funding to do studies on insects. Really, uh, it's very hard to come by, and there's a lot of money uh, arrayed against insects because uh, you know pesticides are a big deal. So um, it actually comes down to, as far as I can tell, farming practices. If there were, if they could, uh, if farmers can be uh, taught or helped to farm in different ways, uh, that stop, stopping chemical use for one thing. So, now, there's a problem there, apparently. Some entomologists are saying, well, if we stop pesticide use, then there will be more pest damage to crops, and then they'll have to expand fields to grow more crops to take account of the pesticide use. Uh So maybe that's not, you know, uh, maybe it's the kind of pesticides we're using. If we can... Do, if we can use pesticides that don't actually kill the soil and don't kill everything in its path, yeah, that natu- would be nice. I mean, can we use natural deterrents or something? I don't know. We yeah, and, and partner plantings. And I mean, of stuff. course, we will run into the eternal problem, which is that the big pharma, big chemical companies will lobby against this. And that's mm, sure. really where all these problems sort of come down to, you know, a, this, this sort of huge impasse. Predatory capitalism again. Well, yeah. I yeah. think what everybody's describing, though, is a world that is seriously out of balance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. it's awful. And uh, it really, I mean, this thing, the apocalypse, it sounds, it's scary. it sounds like it's a just clickbait. But actually, 
entomologists are very worried about this. The people who actually have been watching this happen for years. There's a guy who's been talking about this for 40 years, and uh, and he's finally going, well, you know, nothing's going to happen. He's in his 80s now, and he's going, oh, well, nobody's going to do anything. Yeah, well, that's the thing. <laughs> we, need a fi- we need a 12-year-old to bring it all. Something so, I think of, uh, a score I've thought of maybe hundreds of times, in I don't know how many of the last decades, hmm. um, is is what Jacques Cousteau recorded and said about the oceans. It's, hmm. it's not dissimilar. I mean, he's been gone for a long time. He sent out a really serious warning decades and decades ago. Yeah. Yeah. He said, the ocean used to look like this. And, of course, he had footage galore. For goodness sake, that's hmm. what he did. Hmm. And then he showed footage of a couple decades later, mm-hmm. and it was looking pretty desolate. Mm-hmm. And he, he said, "This is this is a dire situation." Mm-hmm. And you know, warning, warning, and uh, you know, nothing. Yeah, we have an You're out of cool. sight, out of mind problem. In, you know, in in this on this planet, and if we don't see it. You know, it, it's not a problem, so we don't see the bugs. We don't see under the water. Um, well, yeah, and I don't even know if he'd gotten to the part about the plastics in the ocean. No, was, I, I think he was just talking about overfishing and, yeah. you know, things like that. I'm not I'm not exactly sure. Maybe he was talking about, you know, ambient pollution from boats. Right. I, I don't know. But They're not fishing anymore. They're mining. Yeah. Oh, they have those nets that take everything in its path. They just... And, and then they, they throw they away the stuff that most of it out. they yeah. don't want. And it, they're dragging so, across the seafloor and all. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, fish are, Humans. I mean, nothing is really valued except as a commodity, and no sure. one really has, it seems like the big picture of the web of life, mm-hmm. which is so fundamental and so common sense and so indigenous mm-hmm. a concept. Well, I don't know about you, Sally, and I... I'm going to guess that you're this way, but I every time I read something new like this, and I read about this uh, a few months ago, I'm in deep mourning. I, I, I just I'd have to describe my feelings, or I'm mourning. Mm. And uh, and there are uh, articles I look at, and I go, I don't even want to read this. I just can't. Mm-hmm. I can't let it into my system anymore. I'm just so sad and sorry. Mm. And well, it's yeah. get, and it, and the it, the momentum it's it's faster and faster. Yep. And it's 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 the devastation is made even greater by the fact that we have a system in place that wants to keep this going. Mm-hmm. They yeah. want to keep doing things the way they're doing them, and they don't want to have to change mm-hmm. and. Just continually denying reality. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. On well, that note, um, <laughs> I guess I'll go take an overdose. Yeah, thanks. Oh, I'll be joining boy. you later. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, though. Very important, and and really taps into so much mm. that is it truly devastating, but so important. So thank you. Well, thanks thank for calling, thanks Sally. For you know, it seems to me that there are uh, solutions that we haven't that we well, haven't really contemplated that are uh, put things more in balance. For example, um, food on the, food on this planet. We grow enough food for everyone. Mm. It's the distribution of the food that mm. is the problem. So if we uh, were able to uh, uh, bring the distribution more in line, we literally would not have to grow as much. Mm. And if that were the case, we would have more land that we could uh, lay fallow and regenerate. I was just reading this morning, thir- about 30% of produce grown in fields in America anyway stays there. It's just not marketable because the tomatoes are the wrong color or the wrong shape or the potatoes have mm. got a hole in them. Yeah, I think. So. And then once they get to stores, 50 percent of it gets thrown away. There are I, I believe, you know, there have been stores that started up specifically to sell those type of yeah. fruits and vegetables. Yeah. Uh, other um, other things to do with habitat loss. Uh, we have a caller. Hang on, caller, just a moment. Uh, they're talking about land sparing. 
which is the uh, fully industrializing agriculture wherever it is currently being done to maximize yields in order to spare as much other land as possible for native ecosystems, which is Ah. what I was just talking about. The other one is land sharing and argues for a matrix of wild areas and nature-friendly agriculture in conjunction with each other, which, Mm -hmm. of course, sounds wonderful. Will it ever get done? I don't know. Oh, turn your radio off, please, caller. Oh. Hello, caller. You will be on the air once you turn off your radio. That would be great. Hello. You're on the air. Hello, this is Charles. Charlie. What are you doing? How are y'all? You have no excuse for this radio thing. <laughs> what a pro. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, first of all, Paul, I think it was really good of you, even though it scares me, to use the word apocalypse. Um, let me turn my radio off again. <laughs> I've always wanted to be Jimi Hendrix, so here we go. <laughs> anyway, uh, I wanted to listen to you guys while I was talking. But anyway, the, the word apocalypse is freaky. It scares people. It pushes religious buttons. But it wakes people up, I think. And uh, yeah. when Shelley was talking about out of sight, out of mind, I think that we all can find examples of where things are different, like walking these beautiful beaches here, all of a sudden there are no more starfish around. Mm-hmm. And apparently it has to do with the, the PX or something of uh, the water. Oh, the water is getting more acid? Yeah. We yeah. don't even know what isn't there, yeah. wasn't there. We... The ocean and oceans and insects are both all, you know, mostly unexplored. We really know more about space than we do about the oceans, for example, and certainly more than we do about uh, insect species, apparently. Yeah, and then the attitudinal thing for centuries, you know, these different texts, some of them religious, saying that man has domain, humans have domain over animals, Mm. uh, which is really a bizarre thing when you start separating the animals out from humans and... uh, you know the the research that needs to be uh, that needs to be made public. I think we got to pull people into. I'm sorry to use this word, but the movement to because mm. it's like a war. I mean, we're losing. It's like yep. it's like, like that. I mean, I also want to slip in today is my wonderful sister Alexander Morgan's 64th birthday, and <laughs> she has an outfit in the city called Family House which provides free housing to children who have cancer Mm. being treated there in Mission Bay, where she has a facility uh, at UC Med Center. And she passed on to us that 70% of those kids have cancer because they come from the valleys Mm -hmm. where there are pesticides and herbicides. Yes. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm looking for direct, you know, examples that I can present to people who have doubts about, <clears throat> you know, why different species are dying. But uh, I want to just reiterate that that, you know, word apocalypse, mm. I think we ought to lean into more and more because I think it catches people's attention. Yeah. You yeah. Know, not, not that I want to scare people to death, but um, as humans, we have to start seeing more of a connection between the different life forms and... Uh, mm-hmm. No, not not just go toddle a ta, you know. Um, I'm just going to go have fun and just ignore it, you know, yeah. because it won't be ignored. Anyway. Yeah, especially uh, when whales wash ashore because of lack of sea bugs, right? Yeah. 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 Plankton and bugs of the sea. Yeah. Is that yeah. what's... Yeah, there is a starvation yeah, going starvation. on. Yeah, starvation. Wow. Yeah. 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 Anyway, also, just real quick about food going to waste. When I was in India in 1977, they had warehouses and, you know, bumper crops of rice. Mm -hmm. And because of, uh, you know, clever business uh, movements, there were people that were still starving, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's get the food to the people. And And I was uh, eating all my food, Charlie, on the plate because they were starving. (laughs) That's right. Right. Anyway, yeah, well, maybe, you uh, you know, I could have eaten the plate. Um, But uh, (laughs) anyway, uh, I'll be listening. Thank you, uh, Charlie. Thank you for this. And I really think we got to keep pushing that word apocalypse Apocalypse. because I think it catches people. You know, the Uh, thought occurred to me that um, 
when we were talking about agricultural practices and being able to uh, give more land back to the insects and the animals, is that so much of uh, what we grow uh, is feed for animals, mm. for particularly uh, cows and uh, et cetera. And uh, if, you, if you just didn't need to plant all those that corn, yeah. soybeans to feed animals, mm-hmm. I would think yeah. that would free up an awful lot of... And- Land. And we're feeding the, the plains, animals, the, great the animals that we were going to eat, we're feeding them bad food. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So. Thank you, Charlie. All right. Thank you, folks. I'll be listening. Thanks, okay. Bye-bye. Bye bye. And the number is 415-663-8492. Give us a call and uh, share your depression. <laughs> We're all kind of sitting here going, oh. Well, I think, you know, we talked about, I, I don't know what topic. I mean, pick a topic. It all comes back to the same mm-hmm. thing. It does. That our world is being run by corporate entities mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. the world over. And they're making choices solely about money and they're avoiding this issue as as strongly as they possibly can mm-hmm. that's right yeah, for as long as they possibly can yeah. and so it's it's our leadership that has to change it's the shareholders they are beholden to the shareholders well only... the, the shareholders need to speak up well, and yes, say i i don't do. yeah we but their the only thing is that they have to make profits for their shareholders. You know, that it, is the idea of a corporation. It is mm. beginning. There are it's a there, bad system. There are huge. Yeah. Uh, there are huge uh, segments of uh, the shareholder public that are pension funds and mutual yeah. funds, etc. And they are starting to talk to these companies, saying, "Listen," and they're they're. Propose putting proposals at the uh, annual meetings, hmm. and uh, they're uh, they are starting. It is beginning, which is uh, which is actually so, very good news. A little consciousness, a little environmental. So consciousness yeah, about, anybody out yeah. there who's a shareholder, <laughs> speak but, up. I know someone who has shares in Monsanto through his uh, through his whatever you call it, the fund. Uh, it's impossible investment not to fund. if you have a mutual yeah. I think mutual we're scammed, fund. though. I, I, I was just writing about this earlier. The the same people, Shelley, that you're talking about have somehow convinced the public that we've got the power to change. That If we just, you know, uh, use solar or buy mm. a Prius or whatever mm. it is, it's going to make all this difference when, in fact— right. The people that can make the difference are the people in the boardrooms and the yes. CEOs and the yeah. powerful. Yeah. The, uh, so the if you're listening, people. make a difference, please. Uh, I mean, one person can make a decision that that 100,000 of us could not affect. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's in their hands, and that's the problem. Deforestation, climate change, and pesticide overuse, all three of these unpleasant truths are anathema to the wealthy world and of no interest to the Bolsonaro's of the world and the upper classes that survive because of them. And here's a wonderful picture of a banana plantation in Costa Rica. As far as the eye can see, a monocrop. Yes. This is KWMR. Spain is the same way. You, I took a uh, train, fast train from uh, from Madrid uh, down to the south. Yeah, the greenhouse. It, it, uh, an entire portion of Spain is greenhouses. Olive oil, olive trees. It, oh yeah, it just right. endless. Yeah, yeah, endless olive trees. This is KWMR ninety point five in Point Reyes Station. 89.9 in Bolinas, 92.3 in San Geronimo Valley, and streaming online at kwmr.org and on our mobile app as well, so you can take us wherever you go. Programming on KWMR is underwritten by our listeners and by the Palace Market in downtown Point Reyes Station, offering produce, cheeses, wines, a full deli and meat department, and an assortment of natural health foods and supplements. And did you know that KWMR archives all locally produced programs like this one? These archives are available through the KWMR website. Click on Radio Archives to stream your favorite shows. That's for two weeks, usually, is how long the shows are online on that site. Uh, these Our shows are actually on YouTube. Our entire roster, our entire history of this program is on YouTube at, L- I think it's Let's Talk K. 
KWMR, I think that's what it is, on YouTube. You can go back and find any show from the past, wow, what is it, coming up on three years? Maybe it's more. I don't know. I don't know. Beats me. Um, so uh, we're talking about the insect apocalypse. Slip, 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 slip. Uh, because insects are dying off at incredible rates, very scary rates of uh, population decline. It's not just the honeybees. Uh, this is part of the th- part of the thing that uh, entomologists are concerned about. Is there's lots of funding for honeybee decline right. and and, right. and pretty you know monarch butterflies and all the pretty ones and the useful ones, but. All insects are useful in some way. That's right. why they are here. That's how they've survived. That's what they and they do things for their, our environment that keep us all alive. And nobody really knows how many there are, how many species there are. Well, yeah, and the fallout. And, you know, we think, oh, less bugs, great. They won't bug me, but we need the bugs. If if we don't have them, then we won't have food at some point. Well, that's a, and uh, and that's why animals are dying off because they're they're not enough bugs for them to eat. Um, well, the same thing's going to happen to us. Yeah, we'll have to eat space sticks like the astronauts or whatever. What was that? They used to have those little chewy sticks that supposedly uh, the astronauts oh, ate. Lovely in outer space. Mm. Yeah, when I was in elementary school, they were selling these things. Lovely, you know, down in <laughs> Florida. They have services every once a month. This guy comes through the house and sprays for the oh, insects. Yeah. I oh, mean, man. it's like a service. Mouth, I, I remember uh, being long ago. This was back in the 70s. I was in uh, Fort Lauderdale at a drive-in movie, and over comes the spray plane. Oh, over my. the drive-in. <gasps> Mosquitoes, yeah. Oh, wow. man. Yep. Well, you and know. we've all got our windows open because we've all got the speakers in there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have to, you know, we really have to be mindful as consumers in this world mm. that we cannot trust that people are concerned about our our well-being. Uh, and, you know, and we get lied to all the time. Yep. Who, who, who can you trust, apart from us in this studio? <laughs> That's right. Give us a call, won't you? 415-663-8492. Um, well, you can trust the bugs, and the bugs say, help. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. The that's bugs who are, you can trust. Bugs are dying off very quickly. They're not quick. lying. So I've, since I thought about this last weekend, I've been driving around, you know, driving into Petaluma and back. And I can actually count on the fingers of two hands. Coming back from Petaluma yesterday... I heard, maybe I'm missing some, but I drive I drive like a, a fly swatter on wheels. It's a big square-fronted Vanagon, right? It's like right. a fridge <laughs> driving down the road. So there's no escape for the bugs. I could hear them, you know, one, bunk, and then I, I think there were maybe 10 bug splats from, coming from Petaluma to Tamales. Now, in the, in the old days... You'd drive down that road in in, in the ranches, and uh, you'd have to clean your windshield uh, so that you could drive the next day or the next time you're going to drive. Wow. I, don't know if, yeah. I haven't cleaned my windshield in, I don't know, not with a squeegee anyway. I mean, a, a, yeah, anyway. Yeah. The, there are fewer bug, bug splats. Even in West Marin, where the roadsides are natural, no pesticides being used there, and very few of the farms and ranches now use great quantities of pesticides like they used to. They used to aerial spray all the time, but not so much. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mo and So and Donna and everybody. Yeah. <laughs> if you're listening from Ohio, uh, <laughs> give us a call. I, rem- oh. I remember in the summer we had these June bugs. Hmm. All of a sudden, just for one particular moment in time, the June bugs would hatch or whatever, hmm. and it would be the, everything was covered with June bugs and talk about your windshield. It's yeah. just like a mess. Yeah. I wonder if the June bugs are still. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, know. I remember seeing the June bugs in California hmm. um, and I think I saw one this year. Oh, we need two. <laughs> <laughs> I saw one. Wow. Yeah. Um, so uh, smarter on pesticides. Pesticide management may require a more nuanced approach. 
Uh, some entomologists worry that banning one insecticide simply leads farmers to switch to something potentially more toxic, which, yeah, don't use Roundup, use 2,4-D. Yeah, right. Uh, tighter regulation. Uh, Europe is tightening up on pesticides, but... Uh, oh, there's also... Oh, yeah. Full field application of pesticides that include seed coatings. So now there are bugs, of course, that attack seeds. And so to keep that from happening, they coat the seeds like uh, wheat and corn and barley and, all, and you know, all those all seeds those that are in those silos, grains and seeds. They coat them with, uh, with insecticides. And then you have the birds that eat the uh, And the birds seeds. eat them. Yep. I know. It's not good. I visited a winery uh, once that used biodynamic farming yeah. technique. And... So that uh, – the way that works is that they they plant things to attract birds and to attract the insects that those birds like to eat. And, hmm. you know, they attract certain animals and, and insects that work together to keep the farm clean mm-hmm. and free of pests because yeah. they invite the pest eaters. Yeah. Into their farm. So, it's all doable. And that could be that. I mean, it used to be that used to be how farming was done. And uh, it's only been what? It's only been 50 or 60 years since things have changed. Since Even, DDT was invented. Right. And uh, discovered. You know, I, I was living on a ranch when I first came here and they said, well, that's the way we've always done it. And you go, no. How do they talk? Do they? <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I think that, you know, it's true across the board. Once again, you know, we know why this is happening. Uh, To fix it, it it really kind of means going backwards. Yeah. Going backwards to doing things with our hands, to slowing down, to to a simpler way of living. Even things like bringing back hedgerows, you know, they took out all the, like, Britain, Britain used to be tiny little fields with stone walls that are all overgrown and great habitat for all kinds of animals and insects and took them all out really well in some places yeah certainly in uh, where i used to work in cornwall down in the west country there they took out there was a there was a, a collection of farms around the area i used to work uh, that took out all the old stone walls these were centuries old these things and uh, so that the harvesters could come in. This was a daffodil farm. <laughs> so they could come in and harvest the bulbs by, with machinery instead of me. Well, when, you know, when you, you put on your business hat and mm-hmm. you're using your business mind mm-hmm. and you're crunching the numbers mm-hmm. and you're trying to figure out how to save money and how to make more money, and it all makes sense until you recognize the impact that you're having on the worldwide environment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's about competition, really, because one one person does it or one company does it, and they lower their price, so everybody needs, well, I better compete or I'm going to go out of business. So they pick up these, uh, these practices, and uh, uh, that's really... So, so leadership means jumping off of that bandwagon mm. and doing it differently. Doing something differently. But you may not survive. I think that's, that's one of the... Uh, the dilemmas, even if, even if a company wants to do it, they may not survive if they right. do. Yeah. And, of course, the Netherlands is doing something, something uh, very different. The Delta Plan for Biodiversity Recovery, a revolutionary new national conservation blueprint. Uh, they are encouraging producers to employ nature-friendly farming methods. So they're basically they're also paying them and pledges to change laws to aid insects it also proposes creating corridors between nature reserves recycling nutrients for healthy soils a renewed focus on natural pest control and assuring infrastructure leaves more diversity than it destroys this there is denmark go. uh netherlands netherlands oh, it's yeah. not surprising they're yeah, socialists they're over there they're socialists those socialists <laughs> Hi, caller. You are on the air. What's your name, please? Good morning. It's MK. MK. Hi, MK. Hi, kids. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Stephen. Um, <laughs> I've been thinking about your, your bugs, and I've 
been out in the garden. We have many, many flowers mm. in bloom right now, and it's surprising how, well, it's not really surprising, it's just sad how few honeybees there are. Mm. But there are a lot of little teeny bumblebees that I've never seen before. That's what's happening oh. where I live, too. Yeah, it's um, it's strange that, that that's happening. Mm. Um, awful, actually. Yeah. Uh, when I was a little kid, as I'm sure you know, I lived on an apple farm in Massachusetts. Mm. This was in 19, late 1940s. And uh, DDT was the miracle. It was the best thing. It was wonderful. And we had a guy who sprayed in a biplane and once landed in the field across from our house and came in and had coffee with my parents. And it was very romantic and blah, blah. <laughs> and we used to run through the orchard after the speed sprayer with <laughs> bare feet and DDT up to our thighs. Mm. And our little playhouse was over the DDT storage. So every little peanut butter cracker had a little DDT sprinkle on it. Wow. And then, blessed, Rachel Carson came along and said, don't be dumb. You know, don't do that. It took a while for her to get a message through. But as you said a little while ago, it takes one person Mm -hmm. to to Mm -hmm. start the ball rolling. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know we've we've subsidized our farmers before. Why can't we subsidize well, them? We to, are now, <laughs> right? We're doing now because of the tariffs or whatever. But uh, I, you know, I was w- wondering how long it takes a field, let's say, hmm. to return to a natural state after been um, sprayed with insecticide for many years. Yeah. If you know, call in. Yeah, that, yes. <laughs> they do have a – somebody could know. If you have an organic farm, if you're uh, – there is a certain time period that you have to – I think it's three years. It used to be a three-year period. You couldn't um, get an organic certification. You had to – it had to be without pesticides for three years, I think. Hmm. I'm not sure if that's true. If you're listening and you know, call in 84663-8492 or 8317. And if you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. hands. I'll talk to you guys again. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for calling. Have a lovely day. Yeah, give us a call, 415-663-8492. Uh, butterfly monitoring scheme in the UK. Of course, butterflies, everyone wants to count them. Uh, They have a 43-year butterfly record, and over that time, two-thirds of the nation's species have decreased. I wonder if all this Mm. heat is affecting the insects. Well, yeah, so climate change, of course. That's changing everything as well. And uh, again, what are we doing about it? Well, officially, we're not doing anything about it. You know, Um, Can I just say that maybe these entomologists have been collecting too many insects over the years. (laughs) <laughs> it's their fault. The only way to count them is apparently to trap them and kill them. Oh, my. They don't let them out. They're all caught in glue traps and and Ruined. things. And then they put them all in alcohol. In fact, this is how now. Oh. This is how the uh, one of the studies happened to occur because they kept they kept all the insects that they uh, that they collected, all these dead insects, and they put them in alcohol. They were they were consuming so much ethylene alcohol that uh, the authorities came because they thought they were making they were doing something terrible with all the alcohol. But they were just preserving insects, so they had like forty years of insects oh preserved, gosh. all stashed away somewhere in some vault, and that's the only reason they could get a, a reasonable count of that area. Is because they had That's this record. That's a little ridiculous, isn't it? It's a little ridiculous, but they're out there. I mean, you know, wow. they're out there collecting butterfly nets and Aww. you know all these big nets that they put over entire trees. In fact, they one of the methods uh, entomologists use to do a biomass survey, for example, see how many arthropods are in a, a big rainforest tree. They <laughs> that was good. Wow! They shroud the entire thing. Uh huh. And they fog it. <gasps> they kill everything in the tree? That's right. What? This has to stop, doesn't it? Oh, my goodness. Cannot we find some kind of uh, technical gizmo that will count insects well, you know, on the wing? You know, we're lazy, aren't we, <laughs> human beings? We're just lazy. Well, there's no funding for anything else, unfortunately, in the entomological world. And uh, entomologists are becoming hard to find. Give us a call if you're an entomologist. 415-663-8492. you got lots of time on your hands. The insects are dying off. Hey. You know, Americans have this uh, thing. little gallows humor there. 
We have this thing <laughs> I, I call the power of the purse. Uh, if the message gets out there, people will make decisions as to what they buy and what they won't buy. I think GMO is an example. Uh, for probably the wrong reasons, people think that GMO uh, is bad, mm. which it is. And uh, you see now no GMO on, who knows, bottled water. It's, for some reason, mm. it's now uh, they have determined that it's important to put no GMO on because buyers look for that. And that didn't used to be the way. And uh, I think that consumers do have a lot of power uh, as to what they choose and what they don't choose. Uh, it, the the same forces that uh, act against us act for us in terms of uh, these companies. If they see that organic foods are gaining market share, they want to be in organic foods. They do, they don't mm. you know this is where they want to be, and they are buying up all the organic food yes, companies and adding and them to we, their stable. And do we trust them to be organic to hold mm. organic? What standards? about Bob? Do you don't trust Bob? Who's Bob? Bob? Bob's Bob's organic. He make uh, flour, and you don't know Bob. He's got this nice beard. He's got. You're talking about the oh Bob's Red Mill. Yeah, that there one? you go. There Bob's you go. Red Mill. Is well, there really you just a said Bob. Bob you know, there was a Bob, or is a Bob? <laughs> but that's been bought out. Bob's yeah, is no longer General Bob's. Foods or something. Yeah, yeah. Do we trust them? Ah. Mm. Anyway, clear cut. You know, this is. Uh, can I uh, let me direct people to this? Uh, this article, a series of articles that uh, started this whole horrible <laughs> week of, of research for me. It's just, oh, dear. Uh, it's on a site called mongabay.com, M-O-N-G-A-B-A-Y.com. And it's uh, it was published in June of this year, and it's The Great Insect Dying. If you if you put that in the uh, search, you'll find these four articles. It's really full of information, and man, nobody knows what's happening to uh, insect populations in North America. Neither the U.S. nor Canada have conducted an in-depth study similar to that done in Germany. Only in Puerto Rico. Uh, yeah, we do not have a clear understanding of how insect populations are changing in North America. Now, it, the possibility, it is a possibility, it's just a die-off that, you know, species die off every so often, every million years. years. We could be, we just happen to be and that we'll the be insects part of that. Off. Well, yeah. Well, and, maybe uh, humans are... are God's way of <laughs> dying it off. Of killing everything else off. Yes, it's, well, that's, uh, yeah, the great, uh, the sixth great extinction, right? And we are driving it with our, uh, oh, with our habits. Uh, drivers of change. Uh, the most in Europe and North America, uh, habitat loss, degradation, pesticide use, and not climate change. Climate change is so far very low on the list of causes. Uh, says this entomologist referring to European insects. He notes that insects inhabiting high-altitude areas threatened by global warming, like the Alps, could be heavily impacted, though that research is yet to be done. But uh, apparently it's more to do with mostly farming practices and pesticide use and loss of habitat and lack of wildlife corridors, or lack of ways for species to get from one place to another, and lack of food for them and lack of, uh, you know, and lack of food for everything that feeds on insects. Bats, swallows, all these wonderful, fewer swallows this year than ever. I happened to be out in Marshall this month and uh, on the water again, and uh, I don't know. There's two swallow families there, as far as well, I can Well, they're tell. still in my barn. Oh, I'll good. Say that. Well, that's good to know mm. that they're still there. And the owls. I see them in uh, Inverness Park. They good year for owls. Yeah. Lots Good year for owls. Yeah. Lots of rodents out there, probably. Well, I, they must be. And there's an owl, owl battle going on I was reading about. That, an owl battle? Yeah, uh, for territory. Between uh, the great horned owls, uh, owls for one thing, and uh, and the barn owls, and the great horns sadly are winning. So all those really white owls that are, fly around. We do have screech owls right now. Mm. We make these funny sound at night. Mm. Well, barn owls make funny sounds, don't they? Mm. All that. 
I used to be able to call in <laughs> barn owls when I lived on the ranch. It was great. We had a oh, yeah? family of barn owls, and you could call them in. You'd see them circling against the starlit sky. Wow, that's Fabulous. so romantic. Wow. Wait, we still have stars? <laughs> yes. Oh, good. That's a really oh, Anyway, boy. the great insect dying. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very, for me, a very depressing. Can but, we weaponize the sun? Boy, it is fantastic. Uh, well, yes. Nuclear power, of course. That's the power of the sun. Um, well, and we have, you know, our our leader in, in power who calls everything fake news all the time. Uh, you know, it's hard to... And with the way that the Internet works with algorithms and all of the, the things that happen, uh, it does make it really, really difficult to get mm. good information. Mm. You you know, are you just reading what makes sense to you because the Internet figured out that this is what makes sense to you and this so that's all you can find? All I get is the depressing stuff, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, I uh, no. It came across. Uh, there was an article. Someone was talking about the article in the New York Times that came out when these studies were done, and uh, you know, some people said, "Oh, they're just it's all panic," and you know, nobody knows. Well, nobody knows. Yeah, and uh, but a lot of entomologists are saying, you know, we don't actually know really what's going on but isn't that a warning sign in itself if we're seeing these massive die-offs i mean it's three quarters of a of a species disappearing that's pretty Uh, major (laughs) isn't it fair to say that life on the planet is disappearing i mean in not just insects i I wonder i'm not sure there must still be well there's a lot of sick humans humans, too yeah there's a lot of sick humans Hmm. you know dialysis centers at every shopping mall and uh, probably everybody knows somebody who has cancer. No, you know, right. when I was a kid, I don't, I don't remember it like that. So, uh, yeah, I know. Maybe they were just undiagnosed. You know, that's always the oh, right. question, right? Underdiagnosed. Well, people are living longer no. too, so uh, it gives right. people more opportunity to. The survivors are lasting yeah. longer. Um. One thing that somebody, as there's a woman who was doing a, a course, where was it? I think it was in, it may have been in Costa Rica. Um, and they invited all these uh, bank executives, leaders of world industry and bank executives to come on this uh, seminar kind of trip, field trip. Uh, doing insect studies in the rainforest. And they all, you know, some of these guys came, mostly young guys, because they felt like you know, oh, a trip to the jungle, cool, man. Yeah. And they all came, and uh, the only thing they took away from this woman's talks as they were doing all this stuff, yes, everything, the bugs are disappearing. Uh, they're having a hard time. We need to do this and this and this. And may, what can we do as a per, as single people, as just people? Um, and she said, well, you know, we need more trees. So, so they said, oh, I'll plant a tree in my garden. And it, that was that was the takeaway, apparently. All these guys <laughs> came back, and they may have all planted a tree. Not a bad thing in itself, but it's not a solution. The, the solution was supposed right. to be that the banks are going to exert pressure on companies and uh, stockholders, and, you know, that whole system needs to change the way things are done. It's like would a, a consumer ban on pesticides. Fantastic. That's great. Uh, it's not going to stop honeybee decline if we're and uh, and this other in terrible insect apocalypse, uh, because that's on a, such a large scale. We of course we'll have more bugs in our garden. That would be great. And if we weren't all spraying our lawns and killing dandelions, delicious. Uh, that would be great. But it's not an answer to the whole problem. The whole problem needs a complete change. A complete change of attitude on the behalf of big capitalist organizations and uh, and the politicians that, that serve and the them. politicians and the yeah. politicians yeah well they serve them That's, yeah so so we're back to that uh citizens united gotta go oh boy <laughs> thanks paul <laughs> been fun talking about this yeah it's fun isn't it this is great isn't it what should we do next week this has been let's talk 
<laughs> Thank you, Dwarf. about the latest Disney movie. How about that? <laughs> yes, really, something. I'll try and think, find something light next week, I promise. Thank you to all our listeners and our callers today for participating. Please tune in every Thursday at noon. Uh, who knows what we're going to have next time? I don't know. Uh, KWMR does not take a stand on any of the issues discussed on Let's Talk. Opinions expressed on this program are those of the hosts and callers and don't necessarily reflect the views of KWMR, its board of directors, underwriters, or members. Uh, we shall return next week. Bye for now.